Thank you so much for joining us. So I am going to start the presentation right now. Okay, so all of you can see this slide. So French Chamber and uh, the Simpsons Expo. So I'm going to give you an overall view of uh, what French Chamber is and uh, the Team France export uh, scene. So here you are. What we have here is, uh, you know, the team working for us uh, in the French Chamber. So what is French Chamber of Commerce? So we are a non-profit association uh, created in Singapore uh, with more than uh, 40 years of uh, uh, existence uh, here in Singapore. It's a uh, self-funded um, association and uh, what we do is that uh, we help French companies to uh, explore and expand in Singapore and uh, Southeast Asia. So you have uh, here on the left um, the team um, that is uh, helping the, the French uh, companies here. So we have uh, over like 27 uh, people working here. Um, the next slide. So what do we do? We are here to create uh, meaningful connections uh, in the Franco-Singaporean business community. How do we do that? Um, we uh, have uh, more than 750 uh, corporate members and we organize more than 200 events per year. And uh, we also have uh, organized uh, committees according to uh, sectors of activity, as you can see from the right. So in our French chamber, we have uh, three uh, departments. So the first uh, department is uh, business club, followed by uh, you know business support and recruitment. So we are actually a full um, you know like a service, a turnkey or service um, that we can help uh, French companies from A to Z. And if we talk about business support, uh, what we can do is that you know we can help you know initially by you know helping companies to do market studies product testing, and uh, we can also help, you know, to do a business matching for companies who wish to uh, connect with the uh, companies in Singapore. And then uh, we also organize uh, acceleration programs and we help uh, French companies in uh, French Pavilion as well. Um, all right, next. So Team France Export, what is it? It's actually a joint initiative uh, which is launched uh, back in France uh, by the French government, the French regions, Business France, uh, the French Chamber of Commerce, and uh, BPI France. So that was launched in uh, 2019. <coughs> So the ambition is actually to boost the international development of French companies. So what we have here is that, you know, since uh, last year, 2019, the French Chamber of Commerce in Singapore is appointed as the uh, exclusive uh, partner, exclusive and unique uh, representative, um, you know, to help uh, French companies to expand in Singapore. So how do we do that? Um, there, there are two, two um, main ways that we do. One, as I explained earlier, we help to uh, address the market. So we, we help, uh, you know, the French companies to give them assistance in market studies, product testing, business matching, etc. And we also help them to participate in uh, trade shows. So we do have, uh, you know, possibility to organize uh, French pavilions. So we encourage French companies, you know, to participate because, uh, you know, France is uh, well known for, you know, quality uh, products uh, made in France. So therefore the Singapore market is uh, very willing, you know, to accept uh, French products and services. And uh, the figures on the, uh, at the bottom shows the, uh, you know, the figures, what we do last year, we helped more than uh, 80 uh, French uh, companies with uh, two French pavilion and uh, five French delegations. So these are the examples of the acceleration programs that we did in 2019, where we help uh, French companies, uh, you know, to participate here. And these are solely uh, organized by the French Chamber of Commerce. So we did a Smart Health Summit. We also did a Smart City. We did a Retail Tour and also FinTech. And uh, for this uh, coming uh, year 2020, we are going to do Agri-Food Tech Tour, depending on the uh, current situation of the uh, COVID-19. So this page is about uh, towards sustainable business. So what, what is it? Um, 
This year, we have uh, the French Chamber of Commerce have embarked on uh, sustainability. Sustainability. So what we did is that uh, you know we have created uh, this uh, you know like this uh, charter in here, and he has actually been very consistent with what we are doing. And as you know, under the Paris Agreement, uh, Singapore has uh, committed to reduce the emission by 36 percent uh, by 2030. Uh, in terms of its emission. So what we do in the French Chamber is, what we can do is we can help to promote, for example, the members who have the expertise. We, so we help to promote the members who have the expertise. And uh, for the members who, who need uh, you know, some uh, assistance, so we can also accompany the members you know, to uh, accelerate in a very sustainable uh, manner. And sustainable business is also about, you know, corporate social responsibility, you know, and uh, this is a very important. So we can, uh, what we can do is that, you know, we can offer CSR events and, you know, we can also integrate, you know, very uh, sustainable measures, you know, in our French chamber as well. And uh, we also uh, will be proposing expert events on sustainable development. So as you are, you know, our partner, our contact, and as you can see, our email signature we have this logo of uh, towards sustainable business right now uh, next agri food tech in uh, ASEAN Oceano so what are stakes in the uh, Asian's uh, agri food uh, sector as you can see in this uh, you know diagram we have 11 territories uh, with very different um, stages in uh, development. So you have like, you know, very developed countries like Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, with uh, around, you know, more than 40 uh, K to, uh, you know, 50 K of uh, GDP per inhabitant. Then you can go to very low, uh, you know, uh, GDP by inhabitant, for example, in uh, countries like uh, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia, Cambodia, and uh, Laos. Then you have the, you know, the next uh, tier, which is uh, probably the Thailand, uh, Philippines and Malaysia. So it's really quite, you know, very different, even though we are in this, uh, you know, ASEAN, uh, Oceano uh, region. And uh, it's very important to note that this is the third region, the most dynamic uh, in the world after uh, China and India. And in terms of uh, the ease of doing business, so this region accounts nearly 6% of global GDP. And as I said earlier, is the third world market in terms of a world population with a nearly 700 million of inhabitants. And there are two important uh, things to note that uh, first, the middle class, it is growing at a very important rate. So it has been forecast by 2030, the, 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 the million, the so-called the number will be 454 millions uh, from, uh, you know, 172 million in 2020, 2010. And the second important thing to note is that there is a, an emergence of a wealthy class. So uh, it's estimated at 40 million people. So this is the uh, agri uh, food uh, environment in um, in uh, Asiano and uh, Oceano. So um, not to worry, even though it might seem complicated, but let me explain to you very simply. So if you look at the first chart, okay, what you can see is the first chart is that we will conclude that there is very little percentage of land for agricultural use only with the exception of Australia, which is really high. And you can compare those uh, figures with those of France. So what it shows us is that, you know, the arable, arable, that means, uh, you know, land which is used for agriculture is very lowly available in this uh, region. And uh, in, the, in this Asian food system, we have 110 hectares per 1,000 people. But if I give you the figures for Europe, we are at 205 hectares. And for the US, we are at 470 arable hectares per 1,000 people. So we are really, really very low in this region. So, so you might ask me, why is it so low then? Why is there such a scarcity of arable land? So the reasons are mainly three reasons. The first is uh, degradation of uh, you know, uh, water shortages. And uh, the secondly is the poor soil management. And the third is uh, competing uh, land usages. So this is expected to get worse with the effects of climate change. 
So now, even though we see that there is very limited land available for agricultural, but we still need to focus on the Asian food value chain. So you can see in the, uh, you know, in the uh, second chart. So the reason is why? Because the Asian food value chain is a major driver of GDP and employment in the region. So as you can see from the second chart, the figures are really too important not to ignore. So if you talk about numbers, okay, so we have about 500 billion US dollars of economic output in terms of GDP, which is around 17% of Asians total GDP. So food value system, 17%. And what is also uh, interesting to note is in terms of the uh, employment. So this 17% account for 34% of the total labor force. So it's times two. So very important figures for you to note. So now we come to the third chart. Okay, so the third chart shows the trade balance of FMB value comparing with France. So majority of Asian countries remain net food exporters, but they are rapidly approaching challenges. Firstly, the region's uh, supply chain is still highly interdependent. What, what does it mean, interdependent? So which means that countries are dependent on each other in the outside world for supply of specific community groups like animal feed and the dairy products, okay? And secondly, even though we can see that you know Thailand and Vietnam they export you know a very important rice volumes so these uh, most asian countries remain a net importers of cereals and they re rely on uh, wheat and maize imports from other regions and uh, thirdly this in interdependence expands extends into the broad range of non food inputs that go into production include seeds chemicals oils and packaging okay so next slide, what are the global issues and trends in Asian Oceano? So if you can see, you know, on the left, you know, these are the, uh, you know, the global issues. So rapid urbanization by 2030. So more than 90 million people are forecast to move, you know, from the, uh, you know, suburbs, you know, to the Asian cities or the countryside to the Asian cities. And uh, there is the growth of the uh, consuming uh, class which means that uh, is expected to double to 163 million households in Asia. And uh, there is also a growing demand uh, to uh, facing supply challenges, such as uh, you know, low availability of arable land and uh, low yields, aging workforce and food waste, et cetera. So the solutions, as you can see, are on the right. So mainly, I'm going to talk about mainly is, you know, first we need to increase the yield because the, the, there's very little, you know, land available. So therefore, we would need to actually increase the yield in order to feed, you know, the whole Asian. Yeah. And the second way is to uh, limit uh, food waste. So globally, about, you know, 30% of all food that is produced is wasted. So it, it represents really a uh, 1 trillion in lost economic uh, value annually. Um, so Asian is a large and growing contributor to food waste driven by a combination of uh, fragmented supply chain and the investment in uh, infrastructure such as the cold storage uh, systems and growing consumer waste. Okay, so these are the stakes and uh, trends. So I'm going to give you a very, very uh, brief summary of, you know, all this that is, you know, lying around, you know, the whole Asian. So the first issue that we're seeing is, you know, agri-tech. So as you can see from this slide, right, in all countries for the agricultural sector, we are talking about the need for increased productivity and the need for smart farming and modernization. So in terms of innovation, okay, so the, the agricultural sector has experienced very weak development. Um, but if let's say we develop technologies, you know, that is applicable to sectors such as robotics and biotechnologies, we will allow this uh, sector to be modernized. And uh, additionally, we see that this trend that, you know, the players are right now moving towards promoting, um, you know, like uh, the sale of solutions and services rather than products. So the challenge would be that, um, you know, the development of every tech is too hampered by a market or too, uh, a bit too immature. It's a room that is very fragmented and uh, it's unevenly, unevenly populated. Um, and the limited level of net income for farmers. I, I would um, 
appreciate if the newcomers would actually uh, mute the mic so that uh, we won't have any uh, background sounds, please. Thank you. Okay, so the second issue that we have here is uh, food security. So food security is a very important issue for the ASEAN Oceano region, whose food production will increase by 77% by 2050. So in order to be able to, uh, you know, to need, meet the needs of a population that is estimated at 9 billion inhabitants. So what are the challenges? The challenges is that, you know, we have 40% you know, post-harvest loss. We have 30% loss from production to consumption. So there are really a lot of opportunities, um, you know, that are very uh, significant for startups offering solutions for the supply chain, precision farming and uh, maximizing yields. So this is uh, all for uh, my explanation on uh, French Chamber, Team France export, and uh, you know the stakes in the ASEAN. Thank you very much. I'll pass the mic to uh, Mr. Lee of EDB, please. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Just let me take over control first. and I hope you see the slides moving. Just a brief introduction. My name is Enkiet. I look after the agri-food development in Singapore, but as part of the Economic Development Board, our main charter actually is to develop the sector itself into a sector that can export solutions. And part of it is to see how we can leverage on the global opportunities that is emerging because of a damaged to me food supply chain ecosystem in the world in order to frankly speaking produce more using the same if not even less resources. Uh, so as much as I have another sister agency that's looking after areas of food security, my primary aim is to make sure that Singapore has the right environment to create the solutions and the exportable uh, solutions in order to get into the different markets itself. So the agenda is as per such, and let me dive straight to, into the presentation then. Um, Wendy has very kindly already set the stage. Uh, she has highlighted how much arable land actually is uh, damaged, especially in Southeast Asia. And frankly, with the population rising at the rate at which it is rising, we will need almost a whole new South America. Uh, in order to produce food for the number of people that we have in 2050. Uh, we need to think very carefully, therefore, how we need more uh, technology and solutions to produce uh, more with less resources in terms of land. There is also the issue whereby uh, meat production, livestock at the current moment, the amount of biomass that you actually feed a uh, swine or cows actually is much less, uh, much more, sorry, than the amount of proteins and the biomass that you get from the animals itself. So that's not a very efficient way of producing food. Uh, last but not least, um, as much as there is much to be said about technology advancement, there is a whole change management process that we have to work with on the small holders in order to get them to think about how to transform the way they do farming and move on with the new technological solutions. Um, in Asia, where most of the population will actually, uh, the increase in population will be experienced, this is further exacerbated by the fact that uh, there has been zoonotic diseases in Asia itself with uh, African swine fever as well as avian flu. Uh, yet, with incomes rising, there is more, uh, there's a greater number of Asia middle income that is demanding more food and demanding higher quality food, but also demanding better nutrition uh, in the food and able to spend more on food itself. So as we look into the various challenges that we started off with the previous slide, we then began to say that for Singapore, maybe that's an opportunity that we can leverage on. To say that even as Asia improves in its uh, income levels, can we produce better food and more food, but use less resources? And that is the fundamental a hypothesis that we are trying to build upon in terms of trying to also address the food requirements 
uh, for Singapore, but also in Asia, if not the world. So I'm currently on the slide that then talks about why we also need to do produce more with less. And frankly speaking, although we do diversify our sources of food from all around the world, we do think that for the reasons that we've highlighted earlier on, perhaps we need to produce more in Singapore. And current local production of fish contributes only 10% to uh, the local consumption. And for vegetables, it's only 4%. And eggs, as you can tell, is 24%. And therefore, there was an ambitious plan developed by my fellow sister agency, the Singapore Food Agency itself, who looks after food security, who is then uh, set forth the aspiration to address 30% of Singapore's nutritional needs by 2030. And frankly speaking, with the current COVID virus situation, uh, it's actually accelerated and bring to fore how we need to be much more mindful of being able to expand the amount of food being produced in Singapore. So it, it then set forth a plan for us uh, that's currently in process of uh, implementation and being developed that we need to look into solutions uh, catering to Singapore's urban environment. And we generally call it urban food solutions. And in the division of the urban food solutions sector itself, I'm afraid we can only focus our attention on a few subsectors and we cannot focus on everything. So because of Singapore's urban environment, we're looking at urban agriculture, aquaculture, as well as alternative proteins. And you can see the growth numbers down there, which is why part of it is the consideration that not only can we produce some of these solutions for Singapore itself, but use Singapore as a platform to test, to fine tune, to refine the solution, to commercialize the solution before exporting it to the likes of the Middle East cities or even cities around Southeast Asia, the rest of Asia and the rest of the world. In the bottom, in the blue boxes that you see below, are the various areas where actually we feel that technology has been making a big difference, which is why, uh, in terms, uh, sorry, making a big difference from a resource standpoint, but also from a yield as well as cost effectiveness standpoint, which is why we feel that we are at the cusp of being able to develop these solutions further and then feed more of Singapore's needs, but also the world's needs in the process. Uh, with that in mind, the Singapore mentality is also that we can't keep paying for those solutions, but if we can help companies solve their problem statements and commercialize the solutions in and through Singapore, they can help us solve some of the problems that we have. So the, as part of the government agencies that work with companies, we make it our own, um, I guess, focus to understand the problems that they are facing, which is listed in the blue boxes below, and then how can I bring together an ecosystem of players, be it suppliers, partners, even buyers, as well as research institutes and the talent to solve some of these problems? And that is, therein lies where you can see the vision statement down there. I won't belabor it, but in the end, it's an aspiration to develop commercializable solutions, which is part of why we've been embarking on some of these engagements with global communities all around the world, including those from France, to see how can France, uh, French technology be potentially reapplied, rejigged to a Asian environment? Can Singapore be a living lab to test and develop these solutions and then use Singapore as a platform to export those solutions to the rest of Asia? So with that in mind, Many of us, are, uh, many of our companies sometimes approach Singapore and ask, why is Singapore looking into this? And what does Singapore have by way of tradition or background in agriculture? Since Singapore is, frankly speaking, very much an urban environment. Uh, but what we present to them is therefore this slide that you see down here, that even as we are seeing innovations emerging from the left side, we have created public research capabilities that goes towards engineering capabilities as well as biology capabilities that can be applied into the agri-food space. Furthermore, as you scroll through a very busy slide, oops, um, sorry, can 
someone help me? Is this a PDF or is this a PowerPoint? I can't seem to step through the subsectors that is here. Okay, uh, let me not belabor, let me not go into the problems with the technical details itself. But suffice to say, uh, there are a whole bunch of logos that are supposed to appear on the slide, but uh, it, it, and it represents an overall rich ecosystem in Singapore of how there are many, many companies in Singapore that can add to the overall uh, agri-food ecosystem. Traditionally, Singapore has always been a trading and processing nation, and we therefore have the likes of Cargill, ADM, uh, Olam, as well as Louis Dreyfus in Singapore to trade and buy and sell the uh, agri-food commodities that is being sold and consumed in Asia itself. And increasingly, we see many of them going into further down the value chain because they find that the Asian consumer is much more important and they see much more of their CPG and retail clients being focused in Singapore. And we have seen the likes of Nestle, Coca-Cola, Kellogg's, Mondelez, on the right-hand side, CPG and retail, grow an increased food application center uh, presence in Singapore in order to cater to Asia middle uh, class. Together with that, from the input side on the left-hand side, we've seen the likes of Adicio, Evonik, Kemin, DuPont, base their operations, regional headquarters, and some R&D in Singapore as well, in order to cater to greater productivity needs in the uh, agri-food sector in Asia as well. And actually, so the growing of an agri-food production sector in Singapore in terms of aquaculture, indoor farming, as well as alternative proteins, is but a completion of the full value chain of activities from farm to table that we do see that Singapore has a role to play. So in terms of new initiatives and activities to try and grow the sector itself, uh, we are in the process of developing and putting in place the infrastructure for an agri-food innovation park where production activities in terms of aquaculture and indoor farming can take place. And it is uh, the envisioned uh, outcome is that circular economy concepts could be co-located within this area itself. And it could be a center whereby cities can come and visit this 18 hectare site and imagine this being transposed into their own city environments to form circular economy, uh, economy food ecosystems replicated hopefully in cities, in very crowded cities all around Asia. We know that capabilities and translational capabilities especially is very important. So therefore, we have put in place a uh, Singapore Food Story R&D program to look into funding research with our institutes in collaboration with private sector companies to address some of the problem statements that uh, we've seen companies come with us with. And finally, at the political level, there are leaders from the uh, what we call a, the Ministry for Environment and Water Resources as well as the trade and industry coming together to see how we can land leadership and chart the pathway towards developing that sector in Singapore. I will move on very quickly to just a, a few slides to say, as we focus on the three subsectors of alternative proteins, aquaculture, as well as indoor farming, what could companies consider exploring or doing in Singapore? And I also uh, elaborate about what are we focusing on in these three spaces. Uh, very much the most uh, updated opportunity that we see in alternative proteins is the whole emergence of plant-based proteins. And frankly speaking, I have a hypothesis that we, I feel that perhaps plant-based proteins could actually eventually be cheaper and lower in cost than actual meat. Because if we take soya beans and peas and transfer and translate them to actual meat substitutes, actually, we don't have to grow the animals itself to produce that meat. And the supply chains might in fact be more efficient and we might actually have less diseases. And the issue right now is the supply chains for many of these areas are still early days and they haven't reached the scale. But potentially, if we can address the consumer needs in terms of providing the right taste, texture, and the right cost to support, can we see a potential new dish on the plate whereby in terms of low-cost meats, you can actually see it being substituted by at least plant-based proteins. Uh, and plant-based proteins could actually 
being used for some of the other modalities in terms of higher priced food uh, options as well, or meat options. There are newer areas in the whole, area, uh, whole development of microbial proteins by, by which fermentation allows you to create a meat-like experience uh, higher in, well, it's a protein supple, uh, source, uh, source of protein, but really the, the sources of that protein is uh, through a process like brewing beer, and then you extract the proteins from there. And then last but not least, we're experimenting and then understanding what are the safety aspects of cultured and clean meat. And would that be another means and ways to actually enhance the production of proteins to feed a growing population globally as well? And what do companies like to do in Singapore regarding these uh, modalities or options? Because many of these plant-based proteins is actually very new to the market itself and new in Asia. And we don't eat, Asians don't eat as much burgers as, for example, the West. But many of these plant-based proteins could actually take the place of your meat ingredients or substitute in wonton, for example. And as you cook curries, as you cook uh, noodles that is oftentimes sold in the, in the food centers around Singapore, uh, they have minced meat equivalents. The applications and the awareness of such food, there are companies undertaking that R&D and that innovation in Singapore itself. And then as we think about process enhancements to bring down the cost of production of some of these alternative proteins, that's a strength that we are leveraging on with some of our universities and institutes here as well. So we're very keen to continue to see as innovations for alternative proteins emerge, can Singapore be that site to take some of the options and translate it to an Asian context and bring it to market? Moving then on to aquaculture, uh, Aquaculture is a very key area of interest because in Asia, uh, Asia is a very key aquaculture production site. I mean, we host probably more than half the world's aquaculture production. And we do see aquaculture and fish and shrimp as a premium source of protein. And what is heartening for aquaculture is that the feed conversion ratios of aquaculture is oftentimes uh, smaller. That means it's closer to one, let's say 1.2, 1.3, compared to the likes of even poultry or chicken. And we do see that if we can do uh, better in terms of feed conversion ratios, if we can do fish meal replacements, if we can use technologies to lower the mortality and enhance the yield of the aquaculture sector, that's one area that actually Singapore can benefit from because we actually do grow fish in Singapore still. And I think that's one of the sectors that we want to grow. But can we envision that besides just growing fish, can Singapore be the... Norway equivalent for some of the species that is well appreciated in Asia. So we think about Norway providing the science and the nutrition and the health technologies for salmon. Uh, for Singapore, we are looking into whether we can be that kind of representation for the areas of Barramundi or Asia sea bass. Uh, maybe we can export, uh, expand that to other areas like shrimp as well as uh, grouper as well. So very much we are focusing right now on sustainable and effective nutrition. In Singapore, we have uh, been able to bring James Cook University here to work with us very much on conducting nutrition and health research and trials to enable better science to enhance feed conversion ratios and better uh, fish survival and yield in some of the Asian farms. Um, to look into uh, fundamental research perhaps on genetics, on uh, more disease resistance fish, by hybrid breeding and genetic selection, uh, not by G uh, GMO. And finally, we do want to see whether or not when new systems like RAS uh, emerges, how can we affordably introduce them into the market itself? And that is a eco innovation ecosystem that we're trying to build here in Singapore for Asia, if not the world. Finally, the uh, indoor ag agriculture, indoor vertical farming, um, Actually, there is still some challenging aspects, but we've been seeing encouraging signs for this. Uh, I met a indoor uh, or a, a organic herb company in the US, and he actually shared with me that the cost of capital per unit yield for many of the herbs that they grow in indoor environments is actually lower than outdoor because their product is specialized 
it's an organic product, so they cannot afford pesticides. And so when they grow in an indoor environment, they get better yield and they actually get a better product. And so based on that, it forms encouraging signs for us to think that if we can continue to work on more energy efficient solutions, create a greater variety of crops, uh, that's where we can actually produce more of the leafy veg and perhaps even fruits and selected herbs through indoor farming technologies. Actually, the pictures that you see down there are farms in Singapore. And especially during such a time as this where supply chains are being threatened, we are encouraging them to grow more and to address the capacity, even while we source for alternative vegetables, uh, sources of vegetables coming out from different parts of Asia, because some of the farms may not be operational in Malaysia itself. So what can we do to help indoor farms commercialize better? Really, the cost of lighting, uh, energy efficiency is very key to them. So we are uh, investing in resources to make sure that we can help these companies bring down the power requirements to light and to grow these plants. We're also investing in areas like analytics, artificial intelligence, to understand how best to grow the plants and achieve the best yield by tweaking a multitude of factors like the, uh, the plant medium, the medium by which the plants are grown in, the temperatures, even the spectrums by which we light the plants, and as well as the genetics, which plants may have not been able to survive in an open environment. But now that you have a protected environment, you can grow those plants, and perhaps those plants can actually thrive much better than even the open field crops. And I think those are the kind of uh, experiments and science that we are currently looking into, all based on a natural, but guided by science in order to speed up the selection processes by which we can do agriculture research for indoor farming. Just two more points. In order to encourage the development of the ecosystem and make aware, uh, greater awareness of the innovation in this space, We've been able to attract some of these venture capital firms to be based in Singapore. Uh, one of them, of course, is going to be Matthew, who will speak to you later on. Uh, we do want companies who are sourcing and understanding innovations to be able to interact with some of these players in order to understand what are the, might be the opportunities available, uh, either for themselves as a business or as an investment that they may want to look into. Last but not least, in my next slide, uh, of course, all events are off the table at the current moment. But we do feel that events are good ways to get together people. And that's why when the French Chambers offered to organize this webinar, I was very keen to come online to continue to share what we think are the solutions needed to address some of the food solutions and challenges for the food supply chain. And we will continue to want to see how we can meet and engage a greater community to bring these solutions to fruition, not only from a science or technology standpoint, but also from a commercial standpoint. So uh, with that, I've uh, finished my, my slide presentation and I will hand over the time to the next uh, presenter. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, we'll now switch to uh, Mathieu Vermeersch uh, from um, this virus, New Protein. I will share my screen because his uh, presentation is not uh, integrated in the in the global presentation. So I hope you can you can be able to to see the the screen that I will share with you. Mathieu, are you seeing yeah, your I, presentation? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for for the invitation. I will be I will be very quick. I will give you some some you know uh, some hints of how do we see the the innovation space in Southeast Asia and how as investor what are the area that seems uh, the most uh, promising for us. If you can just go one one more slide. Yes. Yeah, so so who we are? We are a venture fund uh, based in Singapore. We invest around the world. Um, those are the investments we've made out of our first. A fun one company will be very familiar for the French audience, which is the first company, Insect. We are the, the first and historic shareholder in this company uh, based in France. We invest in what we think are, are, are relevant solutions for existing problems. We, we try to focus on looking at the industry, identifying what are the important problems and try to help bring the technology and the solution to eventually solve 
one of the problems that the industry is facing. So if each of those companies that you can see here address a very specific problem uh, of, of uh, the, uh, the, the food industry. And, and why we are in Singapore is that because we want to be nearer where we thought those problems uh, will be even bigger uh, going forward. Uh, you know, if you look at insect, which is the issue obviously uh, of, of fish meal in aquaculture, Asia is the largest aquaculture market. So fish meal integration or fish meal replacement is the biggest uh, challenge uh, over here. Uh, Via Aqua Therapeutics, a company in Israel uh, is looking at solution for shrimp disease. Again, something extremely relevant in the issue of, uh, in the context of, of, uh, of, uh, of Asia. Nutrition innovation is, is about sugar. So it, all, all of those companies uh, address a very Asian centric problem, even though we source those investment opportunity pretty much around the world. Um, if you can go to, to the next slides. Yes, yeah, so just, just a few words about, about the, the scene, the food and ag innovation in Asia. And what's something that strikes me that when you look at those companies which are um, out there on, on the slides, you know, some of those names are not very familiar, I guess, with, with the audience, but those are the uh, largest player in the world uh, in their own field. Uh, think of Maotai, for instance. You know, Maotai is not a, a, something that's very well known, I guess, in the Western world. It, it's the largest company than Pepsi. It's the largest company than Coca-Cola at this point of time in terms of market cap. Uh, it's the largest company than than uh, than uh, than um, uh, Pepsi. It's is the largest uh, F&B company listed uh, in Asia, and I think second to Nestle, maybe it should be one of the largest uh, largest in the world. Uh, out of the in the animal feed space, for instance, you know the two largest players in the world are Asian based. Uh, one is a CP group that you have its logo number one. The second one is is out of Asia. Um, is is the, the New Hope Group. Um, you know CJ Han is in his R and D department. Uh, you know an enormous amount of people. Something that is as large as one of the largest European food and feed company. Uh, Wilmar. Is the largest um, is the largest uh, sugar trader in the world. Indofood is, um, I think, the largest um, instant noodle and one of the largest wheat processor in the world. So, so just bring that. You know, those corporate companies are very, very large uh, in in Asia, even though they are not very well known. Um, what has been the, the policy over the last couple of years? What those companies have, has been doing is mostly produce more. Uh, and obviously uh, not producing uh, the, the challenge of the quantity was much bigger than the challenge of the quality. And that is obviously thinking, starting to change. But what I want to bring to you is that those companies are facing today exactly the same problem uh, are the company um, in the West. Uh, and because of, the, in because of the, 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 the relationship of their supply chain, they are facing exactly the same problem. If you look at the CP group, for instance, is facing today the same problem uh, in in the, the sourcing of fish meal, um, uh, you know, to feed, especially in the shrimp industry, uh, exactly the same problem of the scratching or, or you know the uh, the the, the bioma of, of of the world. So it's very interesting to see those companies today have on their agenda and they have to solve the same exact problem as the companies uh, in the West. Uh, and and the last point is that the consumer is moving, and this is something that people need to understand, the consumer in Asia is moving uh, exactly at the same speed, in different space, but exactly at the same speed as the consumer uh, in the Western world. Look at the, the numbers of you know instant noodle consumption in China, for instance, I think last year was down 13% in volume. Uh, so there is really a, a very big shift toward better quality, health conscious, and we see very much the same movement in Asia as we see in the West towards healthier food uh, or better food, uh, even though it's maybe it had it captured less uh, headlines in the press, I guess. If you go to the to the next one. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so what what are the you know the the biggest uh, challenge that needs to be tackled in Asia at this point of time? Uh, and, and again, this is very much idea that I just put like that. It's nothing very well structured. The, the number one issue uh, in Asia today, I think, at least for us from an investment point of view, is the the, the diabetes uh, situation. You know, there is three times more diabetes uh, type A uh, in in China to type two, sorry, in China today. Uh, than there is in the US. Uh, the challenge for the Chinese health system of the diabetes uh, type 2 in its population is absolutely mind-boggling. And, and the cost to China 
of what this epidemic of diabetes uh, will represent in the years to come is absolutely uh, enormous. And that is true in India, that is true in Indonesia, it's true in Korea, it's true um, uh, uh, in, in, in most of, of Southeast Asia. So number one problem, this, this issue of, of diabetics, especially diabetic type 2, is, is the place where I think the biggest opportunities are going to emerge. And, and it's also a place where we expect a regulatory answers that's going to be much more dramatic and much more important of what we've seen uh, in the West. I mean, we, we think the regulatory environment of food quality um, and, and, and what is uh, accepted and not uh, in some of those uh, ingredient lists in the food company will be much more stringent going forward in Asia than what we've seen in the West. And this is something, I think, for which the, the, the European and American food company are not paying enough attention. You know, we're dabbling with sugar tax and a few other things. We think in the next five to ten years, those um, uh, regulation and, and constraints will be way bigger uh, and than what they are today. The, the second big sh issue is the fact that the production is, is, is very fragmented, uh, input are very fragmented. Uh, and again, uh, it's it's interesting what you said before. What Wendy was saying about you know the the the, the, the you know what it represents in terms of economic output, but what it represents in terms of labor force, uh, and this is really what what it is about. The social aspect uh, of this production uh, capability uh, have to be taken into consideration. You know, we were talking the other day with some um, uh, you know coconut oil, uh, coconut planters, and coconut people involved in the coconut. A plantation, their largest problem is not automating their uh, their supply chain. It's not really much about quality. It's to make sure that the small farmer that is producing this year will still be here next year. And you know, if for whatever a uh, auto factory or, or something new happen next door, there is a great chance that this uh, farmer will not be there anymore the, the year after. How do you sustain those? small stakeholders or small farms going forward because they provide you know a very very large part of the supply chain and they are not working through those large organizations or those very large cooperatives that we have in the west uh, the, the the my last point and it it's it's a bit um it's something that's it's hard to to also to capture when you think about innovation in asia uh, is that health and nature uh, is not something that goes very much so obviously hand in hand the way it comes uh, in uh, in the west uh, you know in in, for example, in, in china uh, you know the, the processing of of the food towards certain uh, um, you know for certain properties uh, the, the the you know the the more the, the fact that it's come from nature or not it, it's not an obvious relationship with health it, it you know the, it's it doesn't have to be the, it's not the same thing as we see uh, uh, in in the west and it's very important when you think about exactly what sort of, of added value you can bring to your product. It, it, it can be something that has a very large pharma or health claim, even though it's not from nature, it can work uh, much better than saying it just come from the farm. Uh, and again, I think this is something some, sometimes people are making mistakes here in, a, some, in, in assuming that health and nature come, come in, the same, in the same direction for the Asian consumer. If you can go to the, to the last slide. Um, I think it's it's fairly easy where we see the biggest opportunity for us, and that that's obviously uh, recoup what Enkiat was was saying before. Obviously, this whole idea of alternative protein, new protein, uh, is is interesting and especially interesting where uh, the, the 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 historical culture of of animal protein is very different from what we had in the West, and that's why we think some of the new protein alternative, especially at a lower price point uh, could be very promising in Asia because, again, it's not really about replacing, it's about bringing something new uh, to the market. Um, I, will, I will go, food structure innovation is something also that we think is, is extremely important. It's not about new ingredients, it's about new formulation and th through those new formulation having a different bioavailability and different effect on the metabolism. Um, and then I will I will go straight to the last point: food safety, food traceability, and this is something again where we think an enormous amount of opportunity exists uh, in Asia. Uh, we think to date uh, the toughest and the strictest rule in terms of of food safety, uh, uh, you know, are today in place uh, in China of all places uh, in terms of existing regulation. 
Um, and, and we think that because of a lot of scandal that happened in the past in China, we see China has potentially a place where new technology in food safety and traceability uh, will develop very fast, maybe faster than what we've seen in the West, again, because of a very eager uh, consumer to know exactly um, what is, is hitting and, and, and what, does, where, where does the, what the provenance of, uh, of the ingredients. So th this is, this is my, my quick and dirty presentation about where we think the biggest opportunities emerge, again, from an investment point of view uh, and from a venture investment point of view uh, that could be different, I guess, from, from other things. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you very much. Um, Wendy, maybe you can share your, your screen again um, just to showcase the, the speakers. Um, are there any questions to the speakers? We now are to the point where we're going to wrap up this webinar the, uh, and we'll head to the Q&A session. So if you have any any questions, you can type it in the in the chat box, or um, if everybody doesn't speak at the same time, you can also uh, turn on your mic and uh, and ask a question. Then I'll I'll jump in. Um, I do have a, a question for Mathieu. Um, so we had this very nice presentation, and we barely spoke about COVID, which was uh, extremely refreshing in the in the situation. But I do have to mention it, and I have a question for Mathieu from a, an investor's uh, point of view: Is the COVID situation good or bad in terms of investment? I mean, people are still going to need to eat, obviously. Um, so most probably some company where will uh, flourish. So what do you think, good or bad? I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the big thing is because a lot of people are, are at home, they, they rediscover the joy of cooking, they rediscover, you know, what is it to, to actually, you know, face uh, with raw materials and having to having to cook on a daily basis, which for uh, many people around the world is pretty much a new thing. Uh, and uh, so, so I think that that is that is interesting. What what we think is interesting is that we've tracked um, a product category that has worked better and worse uh, across different region, and it has been extremely disparate. Obviously, we've seen a lot of hoarding at the beginning of it, but now that we are a couple of weeks into into this uh, new situation, we see uh, people trading uh, quality versus qual uh, quality versus quantity. Uh, in certain geography, uh, so I think that that's an interesting uh, sign that people are paying attention to the quality, to the to the to what is it that they what they that they are cooking, uh, and and again we think that people will be going forward a lot more a lot more uh, uh, you know uh, stringent about the quality of what they uh, of, of what they eat. but but I will say something more important I think that just crossed my mind I think I think what what COVID is bringing is this whole issue of supply chain. Uh, and, and, and agriculture and food is, is the, one of the worst in the world in terms of completely insane and, 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 and illogical uh, supply chain. I mean, you know, the, 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 the most well-known crazy supply chain is obviously what's happening with the pork industry in China, where you have 58% of the porks in the world are in China. 80% of what they consume come from 27,000 kilometers away out of Brazil. Argentina and uh, and the U.S. And, and this is this is the most incredibly stupid, illogical construction that we've put over, you know, over the last uh, you know 20 years in the agri system. And I think a lot of those completely insane supply chain will have to be revisited, will have to be changed, because again, it doesn't really make sense to to cross the world uh, with soybean uh, to feed pox in China, and then some of those pox go the other way uh, after that. Thank you. And another question maybe for Mr. Lee, what would be the government agencies to contact for organization providing scalable food waste prevention solutions to hotel, restaurants, canteen? What's the process if, if uh, like if, uh, if a French company would, would uh, want to um, uh, penetrate the, 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 the Singapore um, ecosystem? What would be the, the tips and tricks? So there are two parts to that question. One is, I guess, more general. If you're coming to Singapore, who to approach? Uh, that you can uh, approach us in EDB. We do have an office even in Paris. 
and obviously uh, the French Chambers can, can help you connect with us as well. Uh, for the food waste area, uh, I don't, the audience might not know, but uh, food waste is actually a very key uh, consideration for us, and we do want to do better in terms of uh, reusing and channeling, uh, increasing the valorization of food waste. And so from that perspective, uh, the National Environment Agency can host some questions uh, regarding what they might be thinking about in terms of food waste. Uh, to share a bit more, currently they are looking into measuring the amount of food waste coming out from the restaurants or large-scale uh, F&B uh, as well as supermarkets. Uh, but in the future, they will be requiring companies with, uh, beyond a certain scale to propose so solutions of how they will address the food waste that is coming out as well. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Just maybe we'll, we'll take one more question and then we'll let everybody go to their day or, or afternoon. Um, let's see. Obviously, the production of unicellular primary producers in water in Singapore has a higher potential than pluricellular. Ooh, that's a very technical question. I don't know if, if uh, anybody's going to be able to answer. Um, surprisingly, we rarely come across French technologies in the region in this topic. I'm thinking about the SIVA, Centre d'études et de, de valorisation des algues, for example. What is Singapore's objective in terms of phytoplankton bioreactors bio implementation in the coming years? What, what is done around al um, weeds, seaweeds, and, and is there any programs around this? Um, Inke here again from EDB. Now, I'm not exactly sure about the technologies that is actually mentioned out there. Um, there are certain uh, technologies for algae that is, takes place via a fermentation methodology without too much, I think it's too much light because the solutions for light-based fermentation of algae, I think is not something we're looking at. Uh, but certainly I do, I do understand that there are one or two startups in Singapore actually that's looking to using a algae uh, process or, or pathway towards creating proteins from, from that pathway itself. Now, if the algae or solution requires too much land, too much water space, then that's obviously a solution that Singapore can't host very well. And another question to Mr. Lee, would you be interested to work with Marché de Rangis and AgroParisTech? Agro We're looking to share our knowledge in Southeast Asia. If, if I'm right, I think there's already a program going on with AgroParisTech, maybe, or maybe Zilin can say something about that. Maybe he, he's not in anymore. Okay, yeah. so we'll, we'll we'll answer this this uh, question separately. But I, I if I'm if I'm right, um, um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, Zidine made it made an answer. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. Sorry. This is um, this is uh, Jacqueline from the EDB. Uh, I'm uh, the regional director for EDB in the Paris office. So um, I can definitely um, you know um, be a point of follow up for for for. Paris focused partners to explore, you know, uh, interacting with Singapore ecosystem or, you know, um, meeting in connecting with other partners, bringing in their knowledge and things like that. I can uh, see how we can facilitate. Okay, so we're coming up to the to the to the end of this uh, webinar uh, we can certainly share the presentation with anybody who wishes to receive it uh, we'll send it out to the participants and it will be um, the recording will be on our hosted on our website i thought you uh, i hope you found this uh, this webinar interested and um, please uh, come back to the the french chamber or or edb the the Contacts that were will be given in the in the presentation to um, yeah for uh, any further information. So thank you all and have a great day or great uh, evening for those on this side of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for hosting. Thank, thank you very much.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.